Well, welcome back to Southern Iowa and to Pumpkin Patching, or well, it's the Iowa Farmer YouTube channel, but we're going to be talking about pumpkin patching, and specifically, we're going to be talking about Popo's pumpkin patching. Some of you that have been around here knew that we did start a pumpkin patch this year from scratch, a blank piece of land, and turn it in in four months to a fully functional pumpkin patch agritourism farm. We're going to be covering everything there from start to finish on how we turn this. into this. So obviously our season has come and gone. We've actually still got some of the Christmas decorations up here because that was one of the last things that we did uh, was actually have a Santa Claus at the patch, which we will talk about here at some point in time. But Molly and I are gonna be sitting down today and kind of taking you guys through the process of from start to finish on how we got things done. Uh, financing, where our budget came in at, activities, all those things. But we're gonna try and cover everything for basically what we learned as complete novice people starting an agritourism farm. I know a lot of you have been following along on our journey with the pumpkin patch through Ben's channel, Iowan Farmer. Um, obviously you're watching it right now, but um, we didn't really have the time or maybe even the mental capacity throughout patch season to keep up with keeping you updated on what was going on. There was a lot happening all at once. Um, so we've kind of decided to do this video on this channel to kind of recap what happened with the pumpkin patch on season one. And if you find this sort of content interesting and want to keep up with it, I am going to um, create a different YouTube channel specifically for patch content. Um, and it's called Patch It Later, and the link will be right down here. Um, and you can follow that YouTube channel and follow along with me through all the other aspects of pumpkin patch life. So we're going to cover pretty much everything that we can, and I like to walk around as I talk, kind of maybe a YouTube and thing. Molly will sit and probably chat with you. Uh, we're walking around in the farm store, so that's one of the big things that we're going to talk about, but it's going to be a little bit later on in the, the list of things that we're going to do. We're going to talk about what the actual idea of uh, the pumpkin patch came up with it, uh, how we maybe seeded this little bit of uh, an idea in our mind, if you want to say. Uh, financing, how we actually got the financing to actually finance this, and the budget. How did the budget get completely blown out? That's basically what we're going to talk about there. We're going to talk about infrastructure. That's the building. Well, that means we're also going to be talking about the play activity stuff, the pumpkin patch themselves, the corn maze, special events that we did. All those things, we're going to break it down to the best of our ability for you guys. We'll be bringing in some video clips that we do have uh, to share with you guys and photos to overlay so it's just not strictly going to be us talking. If you do want to see some of those video clips and things along those lines that we do have from the season, those will be all over on the uh, Patchy Later. Patch you later channel, I think is what Molly's come up with as the name. So it'll be a lot more kind of like raw, uh, personable footage from Molly and everybody else that helps us out here at the patch. So first thing we should talk about is the idea of how we came up with having Popo's pumpkin patch and why we liked it. How did we come up with the idea to start a pumpkin patch? Well, obviously a pumpkin patch is nothing new, but there is not one directly in our area where we live. The closest um, pumpkin patch from us is just over an hour away, so that's quite a drive um, to get to go spend a day at a pumpkin patch. Um, if you go back a few years on Ben's channel, you'll see something called the fun plot, which is where he um, would plant sort of different things in the plot just to kind of see how they would grow. And one year we ended up doing pumpkins and they did really, really well. And we ended up having people come out and pick those pumpkins and they enjoyed that because it was close and we thought, hey, maybe this is a thing that our area could use. So we kind of decided to get the ball rolling and maybe work on getting this started for real. So as we were kind of working towards this goal of figuring out how to get this even up off the ground and running, um, we really started delving into a business plan and what that looks like. And one of the key things in kind of our mission and our values that as we kept talking about this was that we really wanted this to be a community betterment project for us and for um, avenues in the surrounding counties. And we wanted to be able to make it accessible for everyone within the county, whether that be um, 
you know, physically or financially or anything like that. We wanted it to be an accessible thing that people could come and enjoy. And we also knew that something like this could potentially um, boost our local economy as well. So we're hoping to see those impacts um, through tourism and all of that. Because um, we did get some people, surprisingly, from way further away than we ever thought we would. So that was really cool to see. So the other thing is, is that as you farm, you do know that you're a walking, talking, living business. I do not myself have a day job. Molly has a day job. Uh, so... I have to actually look at, you know, things from a business perspective. And the first six years that I did farm, things were not fantastic. They were uh, really low commodity prices. Uh, so after the few last couple of years where things have been good, I've always been in the back of my mind of how can I, you know, uh, basically maybe diversify myself uh, to be a little more stable if things in farming do have a downturn while still staying within my realm of things that I know how to do uh, without going way outside. Well, surprisingly, things have, uh, and farming are starting to work their way uh, downward right now. But I looked at not only as the Community Betterment Project, uh, you know, I just turned 32. Someone's about to have their dirty 30. Uh, so it's like, it's it's actually our generation's time if we want to see things get better in your area. It's it's time for, you know, the millennials to step up and start taking the reins to actually do some of these things. But also from the business aspect of it is that if I can diversify a little bit, you know, into another form of revenue, that might make me a little more solid if things in farming, you know, like the price of the commodities drop a dollar really quickly, you know, those type of things. So there was a lot of benefits to venturing into the agritourism space. So we did do a video on this previously about how we searched for land to put the pumpkin patch on, but I'm just gonna kind of briefly overview it for you. So from that original idea after we planted in the fun plot to opening now, it was about two years of searching for a piece of ground that we thought was viable and was in a good enough place for the pumpkin patch. Um, we had a few options come up, but they never really seemed like they were in the greatest location to us. We wanted to be um, close to town and we wanted to be close to one of the two major state highways that runs through Centerville, so either Highway 5 or Highway 2. So, um, you know, fast forward about two years after the fun plot, this piece of ground came up for auction. Um, it's connected to two other 80s, and it is 27 acres that we have here, and we ended up buying it on auction. So that's, that's pretty much that. And we are just a little bit off of Highway 5. We are on gravel, but you can literally see us from the highway. Yeah, so uh, basically, I think, what day, what day did I close, we close on this ground? May 27th. 20, so basically in May, we closed on this ground last year. So haven't even owned it for oh, a tool. May 10th. May 10th. So we haven't even owned it for a full year yet, um, but basically, uh, I was able to purchase this ground on auction and finance it myself to, uh, well, with the banks, you know, but me as the person was able to purchase the ground. But the question becomes is what do we do for financing for actually the patch? So we went through a business plan. And if you're going to look at doing anything along this line or anything at all, really dive into your business plan, make phone calls to people, try and come up with a really decent budget and then double your budget so you actually have maybe an accurate budget but you know, come up with those things because that's really gonna be important for you if you're gonna be looking for financing. So for us, we kinda came in at a budget of building this place of right around $100,000. Um, I was planning on trying to kick in about $20,000 myself uh, to you know, bolster this project. So we needed to go look for $100,000 and what that $100,000 was gonna cover was mainly a lot of the expenses came into uh, the building here itself. So the building was a major part of it, but then we also looked at the gravel aspects. Uh, gravel was a big expense, the electrical, water, all of those things that we had to bring in to the business and we came in that maybe we could get it done for somewhere right around the $120,000 mark. So we came up with our business plan. Well, we are lucky that in our area that we have things that are called revolving loan funds. Those revolving loan funds basically are lower interest rate loans actually 
that are dealt out for actually developing businesses in rural areas. Or I'm not 100% sure that it has to be a rural area, but for us, obviously it's a rural area. So we actually got to work with Sheraton Valley Electric, which is the local electric co-op out of Albia. They are the ones that sat down and actually went over their board meeting with us and looked at all of our plans, came up with it. And basically the local co-ops are the ones that backed us to get financing for the pumpkin patch. So we did come up with $100,000 worth of financing to build this patch. We did end up with some extra money for a few other places, which one of them is a grant, which Molly will tell you about. Yeah, so we did receive that $100,000 loan from Sheraton Valley Electric, which was great. Um, but everybody likes quote unquote free money. So we went through our local chamber, which is called PACT, and they have a great program, a great grant program, um, and there's a specific sector of that program specifically for Appanoose County tourism. So all of those dollars go directly back into the tourism of Appanoose County and the businesses that bring that tourism in. Um, so we applied for this grant. We had to write a grant application, um, submit our business plan, submit our ideas that we would be using this money for, um, and see if we could get that approved. So actually the tourism board approved our entire ask of just over $11,000, which was awesome. Um, they don't hard, they don't, they rarely approve, <laughs> they rarely approve the entire ask. And it, even more awesome and cool is that we were, I believe the second for-profit business to receive a grant from the Avenues County Tourism Board. Mostly it goes to nonprofits. So we were very excited that they could see the value of bringing a pumpkin patch to their community and what that could potentially do for their tourism and that they were willing to put their dollars into our pockets to help make that happen. And to clarify with that grant, that means that we did have to spend all of that money on pretty much advertising. So realistically that advertising then got pumped right back into our community because we spent a lot of that money on radio ads, um, billboard ads, local television, those type of things. So, so it's not like the money just went into our pockets to help build this actual business. It, it was just advertising. So that's what that grant went for. It was not actually a part of the funds that we needed to build the actual patch. That's, that fund was completely separate which also was awesome because that did help out with the marketing. On top of the marketing, Molly has a really good Facebook page going on. And then obviously we tried a little bit to use my YouTube channel. It did work. A lot of you guys did stop by to say hi from the YouTube channel. That was awesome to sit there and chat with people from all over the place. Uh, that was really neat to see. But that's what that grant went from, just telling you what all the funding is. So where did we actually come in? If we exclude the grant, I think that we did come in pretty darn close to building this place somewhere right around 170,000. So we realistically went over budget by about 50,000. With that being said, with that budget, there was a lot of things that we were kind of not planning on doing um, our first year that I ended up doing. So uh, electrical, well, that was a big one that we weren't, uh, when I said we were obviously gonna have power, but like, uh, I ran electrical over for the food trucks, uh, and then that was another big expense. Was not planning on putting as much rock down. The rock was huge. Um, we had to put in a parking lot after our first weekend open. That blew my budget really high. Um, and then we ended up buying somewhere right around $10,000 worth of actual, actually $13,000 worth of actual like pumpkin uh, planting and maintenance equipment. That was pretty big. And then on top of it, we ran into a few extra expenses uh, in the building, which we will talk about later. Even though those expenses were unexpected and maybe some might view as not needed in the first year, we are very glad that we decided to go ahead and just get them out of the way and get them taken care of now. Um, the gravel parking lot, the weather that we had throughout the season, we would have had to close a lot more than we did if we didn't have that gravel parking lot put in after our first weekend open. So we're really thankful that we did all of that sort of stuff now. And it's not something that we have to worry about going into the future. It's making kind of our, the rest of our planning maybe a little less stressful. So maybe we were a little crazily stressed out in year one, but hopefully that just makes the rest of the years not as bad. <laughs> so let's start out talking about the infrastructure and we'll talk about the biggest expense that we had this year, which is this building. Um, this building is a 36 by 40, 36 by 40. And then it also has, um, an eight foot 
covered porch on the front. The colors on the outside are red and white. It's a tin building. The inside, we went with actually what is called burnished slate. And when we, we, when, we, when we went and looked at this actually at the factory, it looked a lot more gray than it did. And then when it started going up, it looked a lot more brown than what did gray at the store. Luckily, it worked out. It looks really nice, white ceiling. We put a lot of lights in the building here to, uh, to give it light in here. And then also, we're open during the day. Those doors are usually open, so plenty of light in here. Uh, this works. So one thing that we did that probably on the building that didn't necessarily need to happen is that we have 14 foot sidewalls. We don't need 14 foot sidewalls, but me, with uh, the risk of taking on this pumpkin patch and not knowing how things would go, I wanted to make sure that this building was a usable building for if we had a cell, um, basically. That's, that's why I wanted to do it. And 10 eight foot doors, uh, that's an overhead door right there, aren't worth a darn. So 14 foot, you can get uh, tractors or something bigger in here uh, just to make it nicer. So that's why we went with this side of a size of a building. There was three things that I subbed out. I subbed out that, well, four, because one, one of them's, I subbed out the building. So basically, I subbed out the building of the building. So that was an Amish builder. Um, then I subbed out the concrete. Uh, that was also another Amish concrete man came in, did a fantastic job. Then a good friend, John Farrell, he came in and actually did the accent wall and our checkout counter turned out fantastic. I mean, just look at that thing really sets off the, the farm store here. He, he brought that in and then electrical was obviously subbed out as well. So I did almost the dirt work. Colt helped me out a lot, you know, bringing over the grain bin. Then I did all the dirt work and I brought in the water lines and things along those lines. So if you really truly wanted to get an estimate on uh, the value of that dirt work, I would say probably I could low end 20,000. So you could add that if you don't have the equipment or know-how of actually doing your dirt work yourself. So a couple things that we ended up having issues with um, as we built this building, there weren't a lot of, there was kind of issues. So not horrible, but what we ended up with, the first day that we actually started building, a mini derecho came through and kind of twisted the building. Luckily we got everything back square um, and uh, it turned out from a drought to being absolutely muddy as we built this building. But we got the building up, it looks good, square, nothing, no issues with that. What we did, we had one issue is, is that um, our building was deemed a commercial building. But basically, we put the wrong type of wiring into the walls. Uh, it wasn't a metal braided wiring, so to have a 15 minute burn code ban, burn code barrier, we had a drywall the entire inside of the building here. So that was an added expense that we did not know about. The other thing that we had issues with is that we wanted to have some local meat be able to be sold in our farm store. So Molly called and chatted about that um, with the health code people to say, what can we sell in our farm store in terms of local products like honey? And basically they said, well, as long as you know, aren't serving actual food, you don't really have any codes. So we built the building the way we did. We called to get our inspection done and they said, hey, you don't have a septic system. Well, basically the local health department kind of screwed up. So we luckily were have been approved for a variance of that. Um, but basically they were saying we could not sell frozen vacuum sealed meat because the fact that we did not have a mop sink. A couple of hurdles that we did have. Those are things to think about if you are planning on ever doing anything along these lines. Do more research than what we did, even though we did a lot of research. So as you're building something like this, or if you're building any sort of business really, make sure that you have like a good surrounding group of mentors around you that you can ask these questions to who might actually know the answer. Whether that's, you know, like a professional organization or like even just a Facebook group or something like that where you can go in and you can ask the stupid questions and someone will actually give you an answer. So I'll run outside real quick and show you guys some other infrastructure stuff that we did. Um, infrastructure wise, we needed a ticket booth. So this is where everybody came over and uh, would get their tickets. It was actually this little grain bin right here. Uh, kind 
dolled it up here with an elevator. There were his mom sitting on that elevator. Another thing that we had done is in another video, which that was a video as well, our good friends from Barnyard Fencing, they came and actually put our gates in down there at the bottom of the hill. That was another video as well. That really uh, made it feel like you were entering the pumpkin patch here. And then when I was talking earlier about an electrical deal that we did that wasn't really necessarily we were planning on having this year as an expense was actually having power for our food truck. So this area that we rocked and then also weren't planning on necessarily 100% rocking the first year was where everybody could come and have lunch. So we had people just come out to eat that didn't even actually come into the pumpkin patch, had the picnic tables, everything like that. But we actually brought power out here so that the food trucks could actually hook up to that instead of having generators run and it'd be loud and noisy and ruin customers experience. So we had that happen. Uh, in terms of food, we brought in the food trucks. Molly will talk about that later. Then we also had a local coffee truck uh, that was out here, made some awesome coffee and many donuts for people to come and enjoy all season long. That's some of that infrastructure. I'll let Molly talk about signage. So obviously another thing that you need um, for a new business is signage. So we wanted to get a nice big sign put on our building out front. And we also wanted to put a uh, sign down at the gates at the entrance. These signs actually came from a YouTube viewer. So Prairie Elements is who reached out to us and asked if they could provide our signs for us. Um, and they were great to work with. They delivered them directly to us and they did a great, great job. They looked so good and they went up pretty easily and we're very happy with them. The one thing that a pumpkin patch needs, if you've ever been to one, is fun stuff for kids to do and to play on. And we actually got hooked up with a guy up by Williamsburg called Genoa Bluffs Farm. And they used to be a pumpkin patch. So he had all of this stuff that was just sitting in his barns and he wanted them gone. So he connected with us and we went up there and we actually got to purchase a lot of activity equipment from him, which saved a lot of labor on our side. Not all of it came from Genoa Farms. We did build quite a bit of it as well ourselves with straw bales and tiling tubes and all sorts of stuff. We also went to every garage sale we possibly could this, this past year to see if we could obtain any sort of like kids play equipment or anything like that, little tykes equipment, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so we did a lot of shopping. <laughs> um, so we also tried to get really creative on what we wanted out there. Um, so we made some games. We made a basketball game out of an old grain cart. Um, had a good friend of ours make us some bags boards so that there was something for maybe some older kids to do as well. Um, and then we also went ahead and decided to purchase ourselves a giant bounce house. So we are now the proud owners of a giant bounce house. No, it is not available for anything other than the pumpkin patch season. <laughs> we forced both of my sisters <laughs> to come help us put it away so that they'll never ask for it for a birthday party ever. Because <laughs> it's a struggle. <laughs> And then we also have a video on this part, but everybody needs to have an actual corn maze at the pumpkin patch. So the biggest question that we got on the pumpkin patch uh, as people walk through was how did you come up with the design for the pumpkin patch? I just drew it. I drew the design for the pumpkin patch. I laid it out on a grid and as we planted the pumpkin patch or the corn maze, I planted it north and south and east and west and it created a checker. Went out there with flags, created a grid, transferred it onto it and then I took the zero riding lawnmower and cut out the design. Uh, I kind of screwed up. My first year it turned out really good, so now my bar set really high, so I better do really good next year. Um, in terms of actual like difficulty, I could have made it a little bit harder, um, but it wasn't terrible. Uh, one of the things that we did have was a maze race, so it, well, you basically had to find mailboxes in the maze. People really, really did enjoy that. And then the other thing that we had was a bridge in there for people to overlook. My corn got unbelievably tall. It got like uh, like 13, 14 foot tall, like huge corn this year because of how late it was planted and then the density, I don't know, but it got tall. So the maze was a really good attraction. We'll talk about haunting the maze here in a little bit. So clearly the most important ingredient to a pumpkin patch pumpkins. <laughs> so we started sourcing pumpkin seeds pretty early on in the spring um, so that we could get them planted around mid-June and then they're ready to go once you're opening in September. One place that we really really enjoyed working with is out of Pennsylvania. They are called Outstanding Seeds and they were so so helpful. They answered every question that we could. Um, they actually were fans of the YouTube channel so it was kind of funny when I called to order my seeds and I said my last name and he's like wait a minute. <laughs> knew, could recognize my last name, knew they were going to Iowa. He's like, hold on a second. So <laughs> that was really fun and cool to see and great to work with them. And our pumpkins were awesome. We got some really big guys out there this year. We had some really beautiful ones that came out of the patch and our pumpkin season was 
better than anything I think we could have asked, especially for year one. So one thing we did learn is that we planted too many pumpkins, not too many pumpkins, we ordered too many pumpkin seeds, and we planted enough pumpkins. Our pumpkin patch was about four acres, three and a half, four acres, plenty for us. Um, probably gonna leave it about the same size because you could have uh, just as, it was just as cool of an experience for the people that showed up the first weekend as they did the last weekend. As we closed down, another thing that we did was we did open it up to actually people that would have want to have some livestock with the high price of hay and stuff right now they would come and they got pumpkins to feed to their cows until uh, basically they froze up and rotted away growing the pumpkins uh that's a whole video in itself that we won't dive into here uh, we got some equipment for it but basically we planted the pumpkins by hand there's a video on that uh then keeping the pumpkins weed free was one of my biggest fears um, I've been told of how difficult that is and then also keeping the bugs away from them and everything like that And the last thing that I wanted to do was fail at growing pumpkins my first year. We didn't do that um, growing the pumpkins We kept it weed free. We had really nice high quality pumpkins out there. It was good Going back to where we sat we sat actually out there in a tent most of the fall and uh, sat at the intersection there and helped people, you know, tell them where the corn maze was, explained what the, the maze race is, you know, and everything along those lines. And when they came out and we helped them pick pumpkins. I really, really enjoyed that. Actually getting to talk with people about how to grow the pumpkins, answer their questions, and then take the kids actually out there in the patch and then show them like, hey, which kind of pumpkin do you like? Do you like the big ones? Do you like the small ones? Do you like the, you know, tall and skinny ones you like the short and fat ones so you got the kids off of the main path and choosing that pumpkin the first one they saw getting them out there letting them spread out they they really enjoyed that and that was something that you know was 100 percent my favorite thing talking with people about it you know egg growing pumpkins why we did this things along those lines interacting with the public and helping the kids choose their pumpkins of the year that that was uh that was a major success part of this for me. One thing that we didn't really plan on doing, but that we ended up doing anyway, was actually growing our own mums to sell at the patch this season. Um, we did pat on the back to ourselves and pat on the back to my mother. We did a great job growing mums. They were huge, they were gorgeous. Um, people really loved them. It was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of work, it was a lot of prep. Um, it wasn't necessarily cheap and it was very stressful throughout, especially for um, my mom who had them at her house and we deemed her the mum mom for the patch season. Obviously earlier we were talking about how we don't have a septic system, which also means that we don't have a concession stand here because you definitely need one of those to have any sort of concession stand or food service. Um, so we decided early on in our process that we were going to be using local food trucks to provide food and beverage to our patrons here at the pumpkin patch. So um, we did not charge anything for our food trucks to show up. We did not take any portion of their profit um, just because we weren't sure what it was gonna be like. You know, this was our first year. We didn't know how much traffic we would actually have, how much business they would actually have. Um, but overall, I would say that we had a pretty successful season with our food trucks and most of them would like to come back for this upcoming season. So that's pretty exciting as well. Um, one thing that was pretty cool was that one of the local coffee shops here, the owner of that actually opened up her own little coffee food truck and we kind of struck a deal with her to come out here and be out here every weekend selling coffee and drinks and little mini donuts to our patrons and that went really, really well and we were very happy with that. So Ben did all of the work on getting the building put up and finished and then I was kind of handed the baton with an empty shell of a building and to find stuff to put in it. Um, so I worked really hard on finding vendors to sell stuff out of our store. We didn't want to be responsible for most of our retail. We wanted that to come from other community members to showcase kind of local talent and other local products. So we had over 12, I think 12 or 13 different vendors in the store this year and everybody had a really great season. Um, from decor to homemade tea to homegrown honey, um, fresh vegetables, all sorts of stuff, candles, everything like that. Everybody did a great job and everything sold really well. I was very pleased with how the store 
performed this year. We did have to, we got really creative with our shelving. Um, those garage sales that we hit up, we were really looking for items that we could possibly turn into shelving units within the farm store. So we have some pretty cool stuff inside the store. This is one, of, one example of that. So these are just different boxes and sh old shelves and such that Ben and Colt put together, put some legs on and created some really cool shelving units. Um, you know, some cute little garage sale finds that just really worked out really well for those sort of shelving items. Um, probably one of my favorite things that we created was this table. We found this wagon wheel base at a garage sale and just threw a nice little tabletop on it, steamed it, and I think it's a pretty awesome piece. And it held our fresh flowers, so we actually sold fresh flower fall bouquets from um, a local flower shop in town. And then we also used a lot of pallets and such and old doors, etc. We just stacked up pallets to make this long display table. We made a pallet wall that we hung up sh um, local shirts that were for sale on, and that worked really, really well. Just using all sorts of different items and materials and repurposing them in the store. So as we mentioned previously, we closed on this land on May 10th. Our set opening date for Popo's Pumpkin Patch in 2023 was September 15th. So we literally had four months and five days. Opening day was really great for us. I got to have a ribbon cutting with Pact with the chamber. Um, and that was really emotional for me. My papa was here for that. So he got to see the, the ribbon cutting for um, his namesake Pumpkin Patch. I'm Popo. And... That was an awesome experience as well. So I'll talk about weather and hours. So we were open seven weekends, I believe, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays from 10 to six. Weather played a huge, huge role. We, I would say, if we were open 21 days, basically, I would say that we only ended up with probably right around 11 days of actual decent weather. With that being said, we were successful in terms of having the number of visitors that we would expect to have. Um, we probably overestimated the number of visitors on a Friday. Uh, we will probably be doing a lot more field trips on a Friday. We kind of stayed away from field trips uh, this year simply to uh, get our feet under us. We weren't real sure how to actually deal with field trips or entertain field trips. Uh, we did probably four field trips, around four field trips. We kind of have it figured out now so we can actually bring on some more field trips on Fridays. A big one that affected us, you know, if you were to ask us like, how many people do you expect to have? The main bridge coming out of Centerville uh, was actually completely taken down and closed pretty much all but our last weekend of our pumpkin patch. So legitimately the detour took everybody that would have come down this highway around us. So uh that was a big effect on our pumpkin patch this year so like locals knew how to get to us but a lot of people that had issue they couldn't figure out how to get to us because there was a detour a mile and a half north of us that took you all the way around to centerville and there's no way to get from centerville out here except through some back roads that only the locals knew so that was another thing that was big that affected us this year that we do believe uh, and then one of our biggest bummers of a deal was actually the biggest day in terms of Centerville's tourism. Centerville puts on a thing called pa uh, Pancake Day every year. And they own like, they have like the world record of like number of pancakes served in, served in a day. Served in a day and it's like 40,000 pancakes or something like that. Does that sound about right? It's a lot of pancakes. So we were gearing up for a very, very busy day. Uh, but something that we did learn that if you had the choice between it being rainy or a chance of rain, or being 100 degrees, take the chance of rain. People will show up on a chance of rain, but when it's 100 degrees, people uh, don't tend to go hang out at pumpkin patches that often. So that was another one that we learned. Hopefully that's not the trend, is that pumpkin pa or pancake day is slower for us. We really expected a large flush of people to come out. We did get a large flush of people from uh, various places, but I think the heat really kind of took a toll on that. So. That is something that we had opening wise in terms of weather for the season. You'd think a farmer would sometimes choose something that wasn't so weather dependent in terms of the business, but I, I haven't done that yet. We're open 21 days. We had 11 really good days of weather, probably five okay days, and then some other days that were just absolutely not nice outside. For us, how many people do we see visit us uh, during a day? Uh, our goal was like, somewhere around like 150 a day or something like that in terms of patch emissions, 200 a day in terms of patch emissions. Um, with that, 
we sold season passes and we did not start tracking season pass use until probably about halfway through the season, something that we learned to try and do. A lot of locals did choose the season pass. Our tickets this year were $13 for admission and three and under were free. And then the season passes were $20 per person. Per person. So with that, there was no other added expenses unless you were picking a pumpkin, then you would pay for your pumpkins. So that's what the, t the ticket prices were this year. Um, seemed pretty reasonable. I mean, there isn't a lot you can do for $13. Heck, you can't even go see a movie for $13 anymore. So that's where our ticket prices were for the year. Um, on a good weather day, we've had over 300, probably going closer to 400 people visit us. And on a bad weather day, we'll have less than 50 people show up. So that just shows how much weather can affect uh, your business on an opening day. That is the emissions aspects or jargon. One thing that I specifically wanted to do with the pumpkin patch this season was have some special event um, things and nights, etc. So one thing that we did decide to do um, was we called it uh, Papo's After Dark, and we had a little local concert out in our food area. We got a license to do a beer tent, and we just had people come, and a couple local artists sang some songs, and we had a really good night, um, which was actually kind of interesting because that was one of those weather days that was not too great. It was cold. By the time the concert started, it was dark, so it was even colder. And then it started misting a little bit. So they were out there in the rain singing, but everybody had a good time. And I think that if we had a good weather day, that we would have had twice as many people here as we did that night. It was a really fun time. So kind of another special event thing that we did is we decided that we wanted to put on a haunted maze, but we knew that we didn't really have the manpower to do that ourselves necessarily. So we wanted to partner with someone within the community, make it a fundraiser type of event and have them help us out with the corn maze, with the haunted maze. So we actually ended up partnering with the sophomore class out of Centerville High School to help them raise money for their upcoming junior prom. We did two nights of haunted corn maze. Um, it was the coldest weekend we had throughout the entire season. We were freezing, but it was really, really fun. Um, I was taking tickets. Ben was actually out in the maze helping scare, and I think that was something else that he enjoyed as well. So yeah, the haunted corn maze. That was something that I was kind of like jazzing about the entire time. Uh, we learned how to do a haunted corn maze. Um, I think we're probably gonna end up doing two weekends next year. Uh, we ended up having, we raised about $2,000 for the high school. So that's again, one of those community betterment things that we were trying to do. Uh, hopefully we try and find somebody to actually partner with or do the fundraiser for, uh, the actual next, we called it Papo's after, do we call it Papo's after dark? Is Papo's it, after dark. We call it Papo's after dark was the live music. So hopefully we can find, uh, maybe some community part to actually use that as a fundraiser for in the future, but we did raise about $2,000 for the haunted corn maze. We think we're going to do two weekends next year. We learned how to run a haunted corn maze. Um, we were actually told by multiple people that were actually driving around and doing the haunted corn mazes and doing the haunted houses and stuff that, uh, we were the best by far. Uh, we had people falling in the corn, you know, oh man, it was, it, if you would have come out there and done it, come out and see us at the Haunted Corn Maze next time. I mean, it's, we did good. We scared the pants off of some people. So the Haunted Corn Maze was actually the last weekend that the pumpkin patch was open. And we kind of talked about it a little bit beforehand, but didn't necessarily make a decision about if we were gonna do a holiday shop just within the farm store or not. And kind of towards the end of the season, I did decide that that's something that I wanted to do. So we opened up the Black Friday and we were open through the weekend before Christmas and just on our normal weekend hours, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 10 to six. Um, and we ended up actually changing our hours to Sunday, 10 to two, because <laughs> it just got so dark so early, people weren't really coming out anymore. But yeah, so our patch is still set up currently for Christmas. I have yet to take it down, but nice, beautiful Christmas tree. We actually did one weekend where we had Santa at the patch and Santa came and so did Mrs. Claus and people could bring their kids, their dogs, whatever, to come out and take a picture with Santa and tell Santa what they wanted and that was really fun. And yeah, we had a good weekend that weekend. Coming up, did, was the pumpkin patch a success this year? Um, did it make us a lot of money? No. No, did uh, Did we do good things for the community? Yes. Did we have a fun time? Absolutely. Yeah. Did we prove? Did we prove? Did we prove? Did, did we prove our business plan? Absolutely, we did. Yes. So 
I would consider the pumpkin patch a success, even if it wasn't necessarily a financial success, success um, because of a lot of expenses of actually starting a pumpkin patch. Now, necessarily moving forward in the future, it should be on track to become a, a sustainable business. So that's two thumbs up there. But 100% being able to interact with the community, kind of give, find a way to give back and then uh, do those improvements, showcase local talent in the farm store, all of those things, um, and actually, you know, bringing some smiles to people. 100% success. I would 100% do it again. Would I do it in four months and five days? Absolutely no. not. Oh my gosh. Never. No, nah, no. I, I tried to it. talk him into waiting a year. He yeah. didn't want to do it. <laughs> so, four months, five days, got it done. But um, yeah, that was a that it was, was a challenge. It was stressful and it was a challenge, but we knocked it out. <laughs> bigger things coming for next year. Yeah. yeah, bigger things coming for next year, which you'll be able to keep track of on the. Catch you later. Catch you later channel. So uh, some of the video clips that I did end up making into videos, and I am sorry that that didn't happen this year. Um, no, he's not. No, it, well, I am, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not because it is. it was very hard to do things. And when you were working on this thing, I would work on a project for two hours and go to the next thing and go to the next <laughs> thing. And okay. it was very much different than it was very much different than what I would normally do. Uh, so my editing style just didn't really work with it. So that's why we're starting this new channel to hang out with. Some of those videos will be over there uh, to see. It's just regular Iowan farmer stuff from here on out. Uh, I think that's about all I gotta say about that. That's all she wrote. That's pretty much what it wrote. If you guys are actually interested in starting a pumpkin patch and stuff like that, if there's things that we can help you about, we will pass along the what do they say? Pass pay it forward. Torch. We will pay it forward um, because of all the people that did help us. Yeah. Um, it's pretty good. It's a pretty, it's a pretty awesome thing, and uh, I think that's where we can end this one, right? I think so. Yeah, what, what, what are you gonna say? Catch you later. <laughs> See ya.